So a conflict of interest, I'm a total fan of uh, our UVA group and uh, the late Dr. Jane. And I have no pertinent conflicts of interest except a number of societies and publications. I congratulate all of you if I've ventured out of your seclusions uh, back into a full house at SSF. It's so great to have you here. And this is unparalleled. This is not something we can capture in a hybrid form. And the friendship and camaraderie is lasting. And this is one of those main messages. This message of love and carrying on, caring for one another is a huge deal. I, from the bottom of my heart, congratulate you on your decision to become spine doctors. Uh, I, I want to somehow modestly, maybe without going to hyperbole or being too lecturesome, uh, um, do a small contribution to making you the two of the best spine surgeons and practitioners on the planet and optimize your potential and execute perfectly for every patient every time. And the NHS, much maligned National Health Institute in uh, uh, the, the UK has a great initiative called Getting It Right the First Time. And I really think that there's a lot of truth to that and that's an acronym that I'd like to have for all of us. And all of you, and this is Dr. Hanscom's teaching also, had a great forum for that. And when I came here um, in 2014, I saw something that the UW had struggled with. We had wellness officers and stuff like that, but we actually had uh, a wellness professional already installed. And it tried to instill on each and every one of our trainees the thought of you're a professional athlete, actually, but not just for a, a kind of a short period of five years or so. You're a lifelong professional athlete. And just as some reach a recent superstar show. Um, this is, uh, requires focus, this requires taking your responsibilities seriously and taking care of yourself and presenting yourself accordingly. And you clearly don't want to be Dr. Death and have Alec Baldwin and Christian Slater adjud adjudicate you. There must be nothing worse than that fate of being the star of a TV series, having those two characters uh, adjudicate over you. Uh, spine is a f amazingly gratifying specialty. Uh, this is why I'm so passionate about it, and it's amazingly humbling. Just the other day, I had a horrible complication, I think not to our fault, uh, and we're still working our way through that, but Murphy's Law truly applies, and anything that can go wrong will go wrong at any moment if you leave something untouched or unseen or unsaid. And this is one of those things that's not meant to instill anxiety here, but increase your zen-like composure and realization that you want to be uh, really always clear and clear in uh, your mind in terms of absorbing what's going on. Now, a couple of years ago at UW, we developed this Ten Commandments, and it's obviously an inviting number, but we like to have simple numbers, and ten has been throughout pop culture very uh, often um, used. And again, in AO, we always had the Ten Commandments also in terms of AO principles. So um, the main secret of success, I think, is very clear, being always calm, organized, trying to understand your brain, whether it's getting agitated or is uh, able to function, because of course you're going to be at your best when you have your neurons concentrated and organized. And again, this is why, the, why these Ten Commandments kind of came around uh, and evolved over time. Rule number one is always right patient, right time, right level, right side. Just taking that extra key moment, Mark said it so beautifully, those extra 20 minutes of preparation can, send you tw can save you 20 years of misery if you have not done this key first step. And you'd never ever want to do Columbus surgery, which is exploring around. We don't do that. We have a focal, clear target in mind and we'll document that and execute it perfectly. So that's the key thing, and that's, again, the preparation part. Number two, and some of those things sound like minutiae, but they all are born out of a very, very uh, uh, larger uh, scale of input. Never, ever scrimp on positioning. Make sure that that patient is perfectly positioned. This is your job, it's not the nurse's job. That chin on chest deformity, where the chin rubs into the chest pad, that patient's gonna have a catastrophe. That head, the eyes that are below the heart level, if that patient wakes up with pion, what is that? What is pie on? Say it loud. Posterior ischemic optic neuropathy. I've had three patients in my life. I hope I'll never have one again. I don't know what exactly happened, but I know for a fact that if the eyeballs are below the heart level, that's a problem. So make sure your positioning is right. That includes all those little silly details like EKG leads. I swear to God, if that EKG lead is in the wrong position, there will be a problem with that inner body spacious. Something will break off or something unusual will happen where you wish that darn EKG lead wouldn't be there. Isn't that right, Charlie? I mean, it's just never fails. 
Um, number three, and this is again just a silly little thing, but words I never want to hear is, oh, it's sterile under there. This is, uh, it's prepped underneath that drape. This just to me shows that you were not adequately prepared, that you did not think through what are you going to do. Most classic situations are upper thoracic spine, and some of drapes exactly to the T2 spinous process. Guess what? You're going to do some really bad stuff at that upper thoracic spine because it's not going to work. You have to drape out the whole lower cervical spine. So draping out cleanly and clearly and setting the target for everybody just again shows thoughtful, calm preparation. Number four, of course, dry, clear, uh, precise exposure. Keeping track of how long you take and how you do this and asking for help if you're not getting to where you need, whether it's in the anterior cervical spine or the posterior spine. As attendings, we actually measure this. We kind of keep track of it. And again, you want to just learn how to be very efficient. You should not require two hours for a posterior lumbar exposure for a decompression. Uh, there should be very clear timetables. For your own practice, just learn to keep track of that so you know how long you'll take as you'll then become an independent surgeon. And again, less blood loss, better start, preserving ligaments. There's always this uh, big talk about open surgery being so painful. You know, if we're a little bit smart about how we expose and what we need to expose and how we leave certain soft tissue attachments standing, we'll actually do a better job causing less pain to patients. And if you don't just crank open the paraspinal muscles with some thoracotomy retracting, leaving them expanded for eight hours and then thinking that those muscles will have a chance of survival, whatever it is, whether it's an MIS tube or open, that's silly. No that if you don't need a retractor, distract it, relax it. Let the muscles perfuse. Give it a saline pause in between. Uh, and again, just be efficient. Number five, and again, this is one of those things, um, uh, as you know, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, but I'm not afraid of repairing the dura and reconstructing it. But at the same time, uh, don't do an unintended dural invasion. It just, again, shows that you're not prepared as to anatomy or post-surgical abnormalities. So again, anticipation, execution uh, come to play there because it just sets off and costs you an hour. And if you want to interpret or not a dural tear as a complication that was unintended, um, de facto, it causes at least half an hour plus an hour um, or more length of stay, resource utilization, etc. So uh, it is a alteration of the surgical plan. Number six is one of those things that, again, I really don't like messy cables. I don't like dropped instruments. I worked at an institution, I'm not going to mention the name, where if you dropped a Midas, you had a problem. You had to resort to osteotomes or something like that. Now I live in heaven and uh, new Midas appears, but I still have instinctively never come over that trauma of not having a tool because it was inadvertently dropped. So just being aware, not having cables be locked over, and again, using only what's necessary. There are multiple gadgets that are now available. They all have cables on it. The successful surgeons have everything organized. Watch Dr. Pimenta later. There's not a mess laying around on the table and nothing floats around. Everything is nice and clean and clear. And number seven, and we're not dropping things, no cable mess. Number seven, again, this is one of those things. Uh, all tools, cottonoids, sponges, instruments belong either on the Mayo stand or in your hands on the patient. There should not be anything dropped or laid without announcement on the patient because guess what? You'll lose them. The worst thing at the end of a successful long case is a missing half by half. This is a, a horrible thing to see 10 poor OR nurses on their hands and knees uh, going through filters and trash bags. If you stay with my plan, you'll not drop your remote, no, uh, you'll, you'll actually have a far cooler, far uh, longer thing. And again, work with your scrub techs so that you uh, establish ground rules as to is this a bazaar here where you can grab your own stuff or is it something where uh, you have a clear exchange program. And finally, and I usually play a song here, but now due to tech problems, I'm not going to do that. Uh, there used to be an artist, he's actually still alive, Paul Simon, had a great song, Slip Sliding Away. Anybody from the younger generation know who it is or that song? I'm not going to intonate, but Lewis knows it, right? Slip sliding away, no sliding and no plunging, no slipping, no... This is the song, and this is so visionary, slip sliding away. You know that nearer your destination, the more you slip sliding away. You're on the home stretch. Focus, stay focused. Don't slip, don't slide, no plunging. Analyze when this happens uh, and avoid it. These are all avoidable things.
For power tools, this is a Dr. Hanskinism. Two hands on power tools. We've had this for a long time. Realize uh, curettes, et cetera, are cutting tools. Uh, anything at any point in time can plunge, and again, you can cause a lifetime of paralysis if something slips out of your hand. So especially as you do less invasive surgeries with smaller holes, realize that the mechanics of what you're doing can be very arduous and can lead to catastrophes if you, in this very small window of opening, hit a vital structure. And echoing on what Mark Moisey said, uh, take pride in what you do. Guess what your best business card in the world is? It's a nice looking x-ray. I actually print my x-rays out. Lindsay was here this morning, used to work in my office for eight years. She prints out my x-rays, has my name on it, and I give it to the patients and they hang it on their fridge, they show it to their friends. It's a big deal to have nice looking x-rays. You explain what you did, you explain what doesn't look so good. They love to see that. They see the incision and they see the, your x-rays. And if they look fine, they take pride in it. So also realize that nowadays, if something is not really cool, there'll probably be some second or third opinion person who will check those images later on, go like, oh my goodness, that screw that's partially going through the vertebral frame, that's the reason for your headache. It may have nothing to do with it, but that's the main thing. So good images, good business, medical legally, it's clear, take pride in what you do. And finally, number 10, we're here to help patients. Do not harm. Nobody gets harmed. Not the patient, not uh, the scrub tech who you stabbed with a knife, uh, not anybody. And not yourself either. That goes into radiation hygiene, being always aware of who is where what. And be in charge of your field, being in charge of the room so that there is an atmosphere that's positive. My spine mantra always has been, this is a German to me, maybe I like efficiency, I like precision. Words I like to not hear is like, I can do a micro disc in half an hour. That is BS. Remember that get it right the first time thing? That micro disc that you're doing gives the patient the best chance to have a lasting result. Sometimes they recur, it happens. Sometimes they become unstable, it happens. But you want to be very clear that you did it right the first time. You didn't look at the clock to be out in 30 minutes. And the final, final thoughts now, again, over time, and as we had this recent complication, these are words that really are important to me. This is the opportunity to create this field, have a network of truly meaningful friends and fear, uh, peers. The other day, like at 11 o'clock at night, I called Rod, and he immediately picked up the phone, and he uh, was just the best friend you can imagine. And it's so great to have people like Charlie and coming here, and Dave. There's so many great people to just bounce things off, and you're never alone, and that's, I think, the main thing. And that's when you look at the Christopher Dunch disaster, he was a loner, he thought he was off somewhere, and I'm not sure what all went on, but uh, this was not somebody who had a network of meaningful peers. And always be willing to teach and be taught at the same time. I'm still learning from all of you, and I'm looking forward to seeing in the lab what everybody's doing. And your core is where you are, your body, your mind, and your home and family. And all those things exemplify something uh, that is very relevant to me. And uh, again, on the top right is both a patient, a friend, and a colleague of mine who became a paraplegic. Those are the key uh, relationships that you want to nurture throughout life. I hope it was not too moralizing. I hope you take some positive energy out of this. And Dr. Hanscom has his hand up. You know, I always like to add on to your talks, right? That's sort of a habit. You notice that? So what was the comment? I said, you, you know, I have a habit of adding on to your talks. I think you noticed that a few years ago. Are we supposed to laugh now? No, just kidding. Go for it. <laughs> Add on. No, I, just, I do want to say something serious in that um, I worked with Rod and you a long time and myself. So in 32 years of doing spine surgery, I have never said an unkind word to an OR staff person ever. Anesthesiology, scrub tech, nurses, and some of, some of them behave very badly in the, in the, um, in the operating room. We've actually almost frequently have to actually talk to our fellows to say, look, calm down. I mean, nobody, we, it doesn't help anybody in the room perform if you're upset. <clears throat> and even though you might be upset, you cannot express it. So I really, that's not necessarily the rule around the country, but I'll, I'll speak for you and I and Rod, we just don't say unkind things to anybody in the room at that moment. You may deal with it later, but at that moment, I think it's really critical to be nice to your staff. That's a really uh, important point. Thank you for making that point. So.